if you're willing to have an opinion online, it will be better for you. Because if you have no opinion, there's no one who's gonna truly follow you. Social media platforms want you to post more content. They want you to have more accounts. So in that way, there's nothing wrong with it because that's what the platforms are designed for. That is Shan Hanaf. He is CEO of a $100 million agency called Genflow. He launched Genflow in 2016, noticing brands of the future would be creator-led and audience first. He's helped the likes of Iman Gadzi, Grace Beverly, Mike Thurston, Chris Williamson, Ali Abdal, KSI, and Logan Paul monetize their content, their audience, and their brand. He's now on kickoff sessions, helping agency owners and creators scale their brand and business. Let's get into it. What's up, people? Before we get into this video, please make sure to subscribe, like, and comment down below so we can get bigger and better guests for you every single week. Let's get straight into the video right now. All right, Sean, let's get into it. So I've seen you, man, flying around helicopters, meeting some pretty cool people, doing some pretty cool stuff. And I've been very impressed with your work. Um, I've seen a lot of the businesses you've built around creators and it's been pretty insane to see what you've done. Uh, and I knew of the businesses before I knew of you, would you believe, which makes it even more impressive. How has it been for you connecting with people like Iman, Thurston, Ali Abdal? How's it, how has that experience been since you know building Genflow seven years ago? Yeah, I guess, look, first of all, um, for anyone... That's coming across me for the first time. My name is Sean Hanif. I almost probably was one of the first people in the world that kind of saw this influencer thing about to happen back in 2014. Left my job, sat at home for two years. 2016 is when we launched, October 2016. It was actually our seventh birthday two days ago, the 21st of October. And yeah, like the reality is to people, those names seem big or whatever. To me, it's just like, I, I've been there from the very beginning. So it's just different because... I've been not only building the clients and the creators, we've been building the whole creator economy. The idea that you can sell content behind a paywall is something that I pretty much came up with in 2016 and built a tech platform that allows to do that. So today you see your Teachable, your Kajabis and all that stuff. Essentially, I built that exact same tech in Genflow and we started using that to sell content with creators and that's where the business began. So yeah, look, obviously it's amazing who we work with today and the stuff we do. We've sold $200 million, this total reach of 300 million audience. Um, but yeah, been here from the very beginning. So it's all as I guess I always thought it would be that if you have an audience, I think it's the most powerful thing in the world. Uh, and um, that's exactly what ended up happening. And so it's like, it, it's different, the feeling of, you know, knowing something and then kind of proving it to myself that I was right, basically. You had the vision, you had the idea, and then you was, you know, it's been seven years of executing. But to roll that back slightly, so you believe that once you have the audience it's easy to monetize it or it's easier to monetize it that way what was the pretense for that like what was the philosophy yeah, yeah. for this so to be honest it's my like growing up so since i could remember i think i was 11 years old i've been selling online so when amazon and ebay first came a thing this is 2004 5 um i was on there selling so i guess understanding online from the early days of when internet essentially started becoming a real thing, I've been selling online. That So that's why it's like I have it from first principles. I was making like websites right at the beginning, making PCs, making websites, and then buying and selling stuff online. And I was selling stuff in days where Amazon and eBay didn't have any rules. You could sell anything. You could actually like sell something fake. Like there was no copyright. There was no, sorry, um piracy there was no nothing you could do whatever you want it was the wild west of the internet so so yeah growing up I made a lot of money um so I've always understood because I always was worried about how do you get traffic to your listing on eBay how do you get traffic to your page on Amazon how do you get traffic to your website actually before streaming was even a thing I set up a thing called dot com radio and from 2004 till six, me and my friends would sit and stream every single day. Like, it's crazy to think that now streaming is this big thing. It was before it was a thing. We would sit together and stream because we figured out how to online. And we just sit and mess around um, and have sound boards and lots of other stuff. So it's before you can make money from it. It was just like a passionate thing of like, we're doing something new. It's almost like how the Web3 people today, you know, were like, oh, no, this is the new world. It's like that. But then... So yes, so I think how did I know? Because I knew how hard is it to sell online that if you were to have an audience, you will have people's attention and you'll be able to convert that into people buying something off you. So it was always been the arbitrage of that is what I understood from the early days. So that's why I was fascinated with that. Secondly was, 
I was a massive forum user from 4chan to Reddit to bodybuilding.com. So again, seeing the same behaviors that people trust people, not accomplished people. So not some author on Amazon. People are trusting this guy posting X <clears throat> on some forum, sorry. <coughs> and um, yeah, so I guess just having that innate knowledge. So when I first started the business, the idea was this thing happens on forums. When it falls into social, it's only going to blow up. So that was always the thinking. But obviously, there's so many steps to go through from there. And now it's a normal thing and everyone knows it. And, it's, you know, it's hard to understand what a world was like back then. But that's kind of like how, how I kind of fell into it. When you started connecting with like influencers, and I don't even like the word influencer, right? Because it's just people with influences, creators, entrepreneurs who build audiences, right? Um, Because like influencers, to me, sound something different, right? But when you started connecting with these people, what was it? their business like in the beginning or what was like the revenue that they were doing so let's say a random a random creator were they like really struggling before they integrated with you and did they have any idea about how to craft offers and craft businesses yeah so i guess obviously in the early days nobody was really making money so in 2016 17 at that time people would just do something to get some free stuff off a brand so a brand sends you free products you'll post it for them so yeah, I guess in the early days, um, we actually do track this. We were like the first monetization for a creator um, because the market was so new. Over time, now there's two types of creators. So either you have your self-starter creators who are smart, they get it, they want to get online, they want to start selling something. And, and so we work with those guys and help them scale because operationally, you can only go so far if you're trying to hire your own team, become the CEO, set everything up, because there's just levels of operations, levels of execution, which you can only achieve through experience and knowing shit like deeply. So now I help a lot of creators like Ali Abdel. We, I've uh, started helping him. He's got his part-time YouTuber Academy, working on scaling that for him. So like now we're taking existing creator businesses and taking them to the next level while still taking on the evergreen, fresh creator who's just blown up. Um, and everything is going right for them and helping them make money. It could be one way, it could be multiple ways. One of the ways is digital, meaning you're selling content behind a paywall with some experience, and that can be all custom, uh, or it can be a physical brand, and you're manufacturing the products, distribution, and the whole lot. Um, or it could be a third way is that you be help you work with major brands. I'm talking like Dior, Gymshark, et cetera. So like just elite brands, we bring them in to work with like special creators. So it's kind of three ways you help creators monetize, and... The truth is, generally, it's people, we call them mega creators, creators that can sell at least like £250,000 a year is what we would um, work with. That's like the minimum threshold. So if you think we can't sell that much, then we wouldn't sign them. And we're kind of lucky to be at like the upper echelon of the market. And there's lots of people have lots of ways to make money, but we're more in the game of like, how do we do something big, big, which is essentially going to make millions of dollars. Um, so yeah. And we can get into even like how you do like rev shares and shit and so on, because I think there's an interesting model there. But what I was really impressed with with Genflow and to give some people broader context is that you do like fitness apps like Mike Thurston's, Matos Fitness, Grace Beverly. Then you do like operation stuff. So whether it is like uh, Mike Thurston shorts, for instance, or uh, like completely different fields right? or software, for instance, right? So you're building out all these different software manufacturing businesses. What got you the breadth of this, right? Because I know you mentioned that you did like internships in software companies. I was quite similar. I worked for Revolut. I was a product owner in Revolut for many years. So I, I get product, I get software. But getting software is much different than fucking building it and scaling it and so on and so forth. So what gave you that breadth of knowledge? I think you're right. So the company has scaled naturally into everything that I am good at. And... Um... That's ultimately it because I like to build around things I understand I can execute on and I have detailed understanding myself. So in my growing up, because I bought and sold so many things from China, I fully understood supply chain. So when it comes to making activewear or making supplements or making whatever, you can, you can then use, I guess, the skill that I had and then you enhance it. And then you hire people into, you know, I've got a nutritionist who's working on the formulations and we're coming up with this drink or that product or this supplements. So then you lead into it. For anyone listening as well, like that's the perfect way to figure out how to scale your business. It's like, what do I know? What do I know enough of that I could like potentially jump on? Versus like, I don't know, let's say using AI right now. If you're not that type of person, we're just doing it because everyone you're seeing it around, you're probably going to struggle to build into something actually like market leading. With tech again, um, 
being been in tech for, from the very beginning. I've worked with different software businesses, so made an app myself. So when the opportunity came to do it, it just was a no-brainer. Um, and yeah, so today we create one of the best softwares in the world. Um, I've created many fitness apps, hit number one on the App Store. We've been featured by Apple. Um, lots of game-changing stuff right now. Our course technology is b better than most of the unicorn startups. You can't record a video, it'll get blocked. You can't take a screenshot of the course. Just lots of smart ways of doing stuff. Again, the focus has always been about creators so we can be a bit more bespoke with stuff that we need to build and what we need to do. So I'll tell you the way I describe it. So we sell everything that you can buy through social media. So if that is in physical products, that would be then clothing, it would be supplements, it would be some accessories, it would be fashion, dresses, et cetera, activewear. It's just things that you would buy through social because that makes sense for us. Same with software, it's more about content behind a paywall, but then that can get wrapped up in so many exciting ways. It can be... I guess content, there's lots of ways to think about it. There's like the way you enrich it. So it could be the OnlyFans way, which is like it's a feed of content, or it could be a course and it's like structured content, or it could be content that's drip fed over a certain period of time with certain things, or it could be content baked around features like a monk mode or something else. So that's the thinking. It's like how do we, we build around how to elevate the thing, if that makes sense, and build a good product for people to come and buy so that, that's the thinking, basically. It's not random. So we say no to so many things. It's like, like I had someone saying, like, side men chocolate, for instance. And it's like, I, it's, you know, I don't think that's for us um, for various different reasons because it's retail, it's, it's low margin, it's this and that. So, yeah, it just depends on that. There's so many ways to take this conversation because there's so much different aspects. So before we move on to the creating content piece, I want to ask you one last thing on this. Is Did you run into... From your agency perspective, did you run into like logistical issues scaling this because there's so much different verticals? Because for instance, like I run a podcast agency, we do sponsorships as well, we do a few different things. Growing those verticals independently is obviously challenging, right? It's a growing independent businesses. So for you, like how did you scale Genflow from that perspective? Because, you know, new creator, new clothing, new stitching, new software, all this kind of stuff that comes with it, right? All right, people, we're just going to take one short little break for a little update about Podcast University. So if you enjoy podcasts like this and you want to start your own podcast, head down to the links down below to Podcast University. This is a learning platform that I've built to help people like you build, launch, and scale your own podcast. I wasted many years doing this, making it all up as, a lot, as I go. So I put everything together in a very seamless and, and easy to follow course for you guys to follow and just learn exactly how to do it. So if you want to bypass a lot of the mess with your podcast, Check out the links down below to Podcast University and it will show you exactly how to launch and scale your own podcast. I think I understood early on, again, by having detailed knowledge about each of the things that we need to run these different areas in a different way and they require different people. And don't think someone who's really good at product is going to now all of a sudden know software. So by having like very targeted individuals who have experience in that field, and then setting up the operations, and I'm very big on operations, so I like everything done a certain way. We have a saying that we want to be McDonald's. We want things to be done the way it's always done. So a Big Mac is made the exact same way in every McDonald's. It doesn't matter what the guy thinks, it doesn't matter what the guy making it, and that's the biggest problem with operations, any company scaling, you'll have people who start to want to do it their way. And you have to have a line of, this is how we do it. So if we don't track it in Asana, it's not a task. If this is not done like this, it's not a thing. If it's not being reviewed by a second person, no, it can't go out the door. So like having set principles in the business and then allowing each department to kind of tweak the operations below that is being the success of it. And it's probably the hardest thing. We went from, I hired 65 people in one year. We went from 35 to like almost 100 in 12 months. You're we having like four people start on the same day in the company. So after going through that, it was mainly around yeah, I guess we chased the scale, you make a lot of mistakes, but mainly I would say it's process and having core principles which you cannot deteriorate from and how you have to believe in them, they have to come from you, the founder. And there's not right or wrong, it's like how you like things done. You actually got to be a lot strict with that than you think you do. Because when you have you know, the idea that hire good people and they'll come and do it for you, like I completely am against that. That's not it. That That's what people say. Sitting here after a thousand interviews, 300 hires, 100 team, you definitely should not let people come and tell you what to do. That is the wrong, that's gonna ruin your business. And so I would say going through scale, 
like I said, it's McDonald's because that's what works. That's how you scale something which is going to like work over different time zones, different places, different people, different cultures. It's impossible to control that. Um, Because, you know, there's always the one guy who's like, yeah, I don't need to write it down. I know what I'm doing, right? Or I'll do it. Uh, He's got his own way of working. So, yeah. So that's been my biggest learning in that. My uh, my friend Tim Stoddard runs a very big agency, but well, not very big, but big agency, and he has a great saying saying that every soul has a role. So if you're going to hire someone, they have one specific role, and that's it. And over time, you might adjust whatever, but you're hiring for a, a particular role, not just hiring on talent, because then that's how how he has grown his agency as a result. So nice kind of similarities, and I feel like for you, two hundred or thousand interviews you're going to see that top talent straight away and be able to position them correctly. I want to shift 100%. gears into the content aspect. Um, so, you know, you're looking at an audio. So let's make this very particular towards content creators, even like myself, you know, I'm at 50K, 53K subscribers on YouTube. I want to get towards 100K. I want to keep building that. I want to keep building that tribe and potentially even work with Genflow at some stage. How would you advise someone like myself who wants to build that audience? I'm just going to pull up your channel. So just give me one second. So I think you're doing some things right already. What I was going to suggest was, so you're already doing the clips, which is good, the thumbnails, which is good, et cetera. Um, I'm getting, saying something tactical. But what, one piece of advice, I, I don't know if you do this, and I, I'm not, I guess in this podcast, haven't seen, maybe you have thought about it. I would go as far as, my one advice would be in the podcast space, reverse engineer the titles and thumbnails before the episode. So already think of, don't do it the other way around. I'll, I'll do a really good episode, try my best, and then whatever comes out of it. I would do it the other way and be completely selfish. So you almost, in another world, need to be asking the things that you know is going to be clickbait, you know is going to get views. And A, from your own intuition, B, from keyword analysis, using all the vidIQs and tube buddies, et cetera, and seeing, oh, this thing works. So for example, then you can ask me a question of, I don't know, do agencies get to 10K a month and is it hard to scale from there? And maybe there's something in there that has a lot of search volume. Or is it you're asking me, you worked with Logan and KSI, who's your favorite or who's the worst? And you're trying to get me to say something that could be more clickbait for you. So my advice on podcasts is complete that. So Chris Williamson, who I work with, that's been one of the biggest drivers of his growth is that it's very strategic. You don't do an episode if you can't get good content titles and thumbnails out of it because YouTube is 99% titles and thumbnails. So that will be my objective, complete first thing because I think most likely you're not doing it in that perspective. Um, Here's why when I you send me what we're going to talk about, like if that, that, if that was done in that way, you would have like, you know, and you know what you're trying to get out of me. I um, mean, you'll see this in some podcasts and it's the same for the guest and smart guests who get on podcasts, they should answer things so well because I'm going to clip this and I want to put it on mine. So really, when two people come to a podcast, both need to be selfish and leave so they can post the best content. Ultimately, that's what we're doing it for, right? And so I think that's the reality of creating content. Of course, you want to build relationships, you want to have a nice conversation, you want to answer stuff, you want to help people. Like, that's all a given. I'm saying after that, the real difference between the top 1% of creators and the rest is that, that everything is strategic. And people don't realize that. Like, which event you go to, who do you stand next to, did you take the picture, like, did you post it, are you going to post it afterward, like, everything has to be thought about, and when we think like that about all these things, then things happen for those people, so that would be my general observation for any creator who isn't growing as fast or whatever, because that's how you can start to get there. It's how you're moving to moving towards a title, moving towards the goal, right? And I've even tried to take on these premises, like even my recent podcast with Peter Schiff, we work backwards from the title, but it's more about being very concise within the podcast. So Chris Williamson is like the master questionnaire, right? He'll ask the best questions, very clear, very concise. And this isn't just about podcasting, right? You have people like Mike, who creates more vlogs, more everyday stuff, and his content then as well resonates and builds a tribe. But as you are looking for these creators, what are the, I guess, characteristics, not necessarily even metrics, but the characteristics of a creator you want to work with? Because I know you mentioned that you don't like when people get caught up in bullshit online. So what would be some of the characteristics you'd, you'd be looking for? I think some bare minimums are that they've got to talk to camera. They've got to be very active on social. They've got to post regularly. The growth rates and all the data has to be there. 
And I guess I will touch on the data first just because it sets it up. So I guess if you don't have 70% same sex, fo same sex following, if you're not growing at least like five to 10% growth rate um, monthly, especially in the early days, you're not on the right track, meaning that you're not growing, you're not putting in the work and you're not building the right people. You want to find as many people that are more just like you because that is the easiest way for you to scale. But people get it wrong is that they're thinking hey, it can be anybody. It's like, no, you have to really define your ideal person. So the location, where they're from, what do they do, where do they shop, like all that stuff that you would normally do in a branding exercise almost, you should do in a content perspective. Second thing would be, what I look for is, can I see the unique point of view of this individual very fast? So can, do I know who they are, where they're from, what do they believe in? Do they have a dog, a cat, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever? The more transparent you are and the faster you can realize that about someone, the easier it would be for you. It's There's always going to be some anomalies to that where someone just became amazing at something and it blew up, but generally that is the thing that we look for and I've seen the most sales on the back end from. So that that story, it's the same as any artist, right? If you look, who do you listen to? Any artist, you'll know their story. They got shot nine times or this happened or there used to be a drug dealer, then this happened. Like, you know their story. Even, and um, so that's why Gary Vee in every interview will be like, you know, I moved when I was young as an immigrant to America. And how many times has he told that same story again and again and again and again because then everybody knows it. So your story is very important. So when I'm watching someone's content, even stumbling upon you, it's hard. Obviously, this is a podcast channel, I get it. But at the same time, if there was something about you, then you will draw to it that much more. They're like, why this guy? Because you don't just want to be a presenter. That's probably one of the worst things you can become if then no one will know who you are, right? So, and there's only so much people can be like the top presenters, right? Like in reality. So that's what I would say. I think outside of that would be their ability to speak on camera, how intimidating they are or how manipulative they can be and just the way they speak, the way they carry themselves. And outside of that, it's just the hustle. So most creators lack the work ethic and that comes through seeing how often people post and how long they've done something for. Um, that's like baseline stuff. Obviously, lots of other depends on uh, stuff, but that's what I would say. Yeah, it's what we look for. And th I, this to you seems like obvious. You know, it's like, um, I would say this is the curse of granted knowledge. It seems obvious to you, but to me and to many other people, this is, you know, very, very Probably, yeah. uh, helpful, like incredibly helpful, right? What's very interesting there, you mentioned even about the podcast space, but having that personality. So the story behind kickoff sessions to help younger people live a richer and more fulfilling life because I was working in finance, I was bored out of my head, depressed out of my head, moved out, built a, built a podcast, built a brand around it. And funny you mentioned that about the personality because that's a big issue I have with podcasts. Someone who runs a podcast company, right, is that it's very hard to pull out that story. And you may be familiar with Jack Hopkins. He's good friends with Iman. Jack sat me down and he said, people don't listen to your podcast for you. They listen for the guest. But you should get to a point where people say, what is Darren going to ask Shan? That's what you want to be thinking and that's how you want to be thinking true. Now, looking from your observation, if you look at people like Chris Williamson, how do you think he has that factor that 99.99% of podcasters don't have? I think, again, there's always going to be somebody that rises to the top in being a very good, uh, let's call it a presenter, um, host. Just like it was in the UK, there was Jonathan Ross, or in the US, it was someone else in the late night show. Like, there's going to be a couple of those that build that personality. And that ultimately comes from practice and being able to ask the right questions. I think in Chris's thing, obviously knowing him personally, he's a, he's a very smart guy. So that just allows him to be one step ahead in the interview to understand what I need to ask here and almost live be able to create the content that's required to make the episode better. Then, of course, it's bringing like, the right people on. Um, and then it's just the planning and strategy, like I said. So it's, 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 it's real thought into the strategy of the interview is what I would say the difference is. But even to him, I say the exact same thing, that um, we need to work on, you know, we're discussing a second channel, discussing other ways, how to build profile. We do, you know, we've got a tour coming up. That's a great way to connect with people now, et cetera. But yes, it's a challenge that even he has to overcome, which is how do people get to know him and his story and what he's about. But because he's on this journey of absolute exponential growth, you might as well continue this and then look to 
start the other side and that's his unique opportunity because he done so well on the podcast side but that's very hard to mimic if it was somebody else i would 100% say that you start doing your own stuff whilst doing that if that's an episode every now and then which is about yourself that would still be easier better versus going pure guests because then you it's all about the mercy of the size of the guests right and every person in the journey gets a catalyst guest or two so it's tough from that perspective um is what I, yeah it's pretty much general and it's not necessarily it's not necessarily a problem it's more so just like a it's just a variable, right? These are variables that you need to be able to work with and be able to get across your opinion and your perspective versus a single channel with five minute videos. I want to ask you about the intersection between the interest of the guest, Chris Williamson, and the interest of the audience in terms of building a business around this. How do you think about this? How do you analyze this when you're working with a creator? Do you mean your interest versus your audience's? Yeah, when you're looking to build a business around this and attach a business to the creator. All right, guys, one short little update for Voix. I want to give a short little overview about my own company, my media company called Voix. So if you are a company or you are an enterprise looking to grow your brand and looking to grow your podcast, feel free to reach out to work with us at Voix. What we do is a fully fledged end-to-end -end management of your podcast. We take care of the strategy, the consulting, we take care of the growth, the management, we take care of all the editing, all the boring stuff so you can focus on creating good podcasts and create and growing your brand. If you wanna grow your podcast and get to new users, if you wanna grow your business, generate more revenue and all that good stuff, check out the links down below to Voix. You can follow through to schedule a call with our team or else you can fill out the application form to see if you qualify to work with us. Thank you. So I think for me, the best ones that we've succeeded with the most, and I'm talking like selling millions of dollars, is where it, it, it's, it's completely aligned, like wholeheartedly aligned. So for example, I work with Grace Beverly. We, we last week launched something in the productivity space that's so natural for her to create content about being productive and then actually living the life of being, trying to be the best productive you possibly can in that she ended up you know, coming up with a method, which we call the productivity method, is literally how she has designed her day and how she works. And then we turned that into a product and we sold it. That's the best alignment of what you actually care about and then you can make content on that because you care about it and you understand it deeply and then you could sell a product out of it at the end of it. That's the best suite of things. Same with Ali Abdel, built a YouTube channel, knows YouTube inside out, course about YouTube, it's aligned. Um, we have some other things coming out with Ali as well very soon in the next couple of weeks. And um, it'll be super aligned to what he cares about, talks about, does. So I think that's the ultimate thing. Well, where it's going to go wrong is when someone is doing a bit third party or if it's someone that puts makeup on all the time, then working with Mac and doing her own collection makes complete sense because that's why people watch. That's why I hate content which is not relevant. So if someone does meme content, someone's doing reacting to something, there's so many channels are just reacting and hating on people and get views, they cannot make any money. So, you know, and we don't really touch those creators. So I'm only interested in like the real genuine creators who actually understand themselves enough and then they can talk about that in depth and that leads to so many business opportunities basically linked to that one thing. Um, hence why I really liked fitness in the beginning because fitness people generally are experts. So like Mike Thurston generally knows enough about exercise and food to look the way he does naturally. So that means we could sell that, right? It's, it was so aligned in the early days because they had actual expertise and you could monetize that. So that's be, always been my thing. Like if you don't have any knowledge, you're just a cool creator, you're entertaining. There's ways to make money. You can make money from the platforms, you'll get some brand deals, maybe you'll be able to sell something here or there. It's just, I don't think you'll be able to sell millions of dollars unless you have a skill. So, and that's kind of like what interests me about the space and kind of the things that I focus on. Cause I guess, you know, I'm, I'm a nerd at, at heart. So I like to do smart things with some other, other people who are going to be smart on the other side. Cause then you can actually do real cool stuff versus just like a cool creator. Hence why I don't work with someone on TikTok who's just dancing and has like 20 million. Cause I don't know what I'll do with that person. Besides like they can wear some converse and get paid for it while they're dancing, right? Like there's, there's nothing else. So, so my whole thing is being, build the right following. It's unlimited ocean of money available for you.
And that's why I think a lot of the best people do so well is because they're so knowledgeable about a particular thing. So whether it's like, you know, Derek from More Plates, More Dates, you know, he's just a pharmacology, just like brainiac, right? So when he created Gorilla Mind, it seemed like it was just quite natural for him. But he had already built a profitable business from just knowing so much about pharmacology, right? There was just so much different aspects here, which made him become a category of one an industry leader, and it was just natural, right? I really want to touch on the kind of hate side of things because I don't know if you're familiar with Bology. He is, he was the CTO of Coinbase, really big guy on Twitter. He's, his book is coming out recently and I recorded with Eric who wrote the book and he has a phrase that, that if it enrages, it engages. And it really kind of stuck with me because I'm, I'm really against that stuff. I'm really against like all like the hating on particular people to grow because you know what it causes frustration, right? Polarizing views and like how algorithms are, are built to some degree. If there's a lot of hate comments, but a, but positive likes, they'll it'll take off and all and all and all songs like this. So how do you think about that when creators go down that dark rabbit hole of just trying to get reactions from people? And like, would you cut a I creator for that particular types. reason? So I would agree with that statement, meaning that you should have an opinion. So if you're willing to have an opinion online, it will be better for you. Because if you have no opinion, there's no one who's going to truly follow you. Again, going back to music or authors people that build very followings, let's call it, they have some sort of view. Like rappers want to live a certain lifestyle. They want to have lots of girls, they want to have this, right? These are all views. These are all opinions of how they want their shit to be. And that then makes you like, oh, I like this person. I want that shit too. So I think there's a line which is, yeah, if you're just hating on people and reacting to them and making like that sort of content, that is just no, personally. I don't think that works. But what does work, I think what he means by the statement is, is having opinions which may be polarizing, which then brings in viewers, brings in debate, brings in this. So it's like somebody saying, don't calorie count, right? So that's like an opinion, which is like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And people want to listen to be like, this can't be true. Versus you're just hating on a person or a thing. Just So I think there's a, there's a way about it. If you can give a calculated educated opinion on something that's actually amazing and we i want our creators to do that more because that will divide people will make some people unfollow but it'll make people fall in love with you even more anything that adds depth to you as a person and your narrative online and your story online is only going to help you grow grow bigger fundamentally because people are watching you and your content more than they'll see um you know their own parents or family or friends so there's so much opportunity to build our trust. You know, if you look at the stats, six hours a day is spent by Gen Z on a mobile phone. Um, 73% purchase, of purchases online are recommended by creators now. So it's not Google. That's not how you find you want to buy something. It's through creators, which means it's through content. So there's a lot of power there. Um, so you want to figure out how do I build that depth? Like what can I say out loud, which is not going to get me in trouble, but at the same time, it's going to make people lean to me that much more, lean to me that much more. Um, even with stuff that's going on right now in the world, you have people like DJ Khalid, who's Palestinian, who's not put up one single post about what's going on, and he's Palestinian, which is crazy, which makes you just think, right, he's so afraid to have an opinion, which is making people not like him. Because how can you not have an opinion on something which should matter to you so much? He's not doing it. So I think I would say don't be that sort of creator. Don't be the creator who doesn't have an opinion that actually genuinely has one. And you're being silent about it because you're scared or worried or don't want to share it. The more you're willing to do that in the right way, the more depth you will build. We saw that with the whole Andrew Tate stuff, right? Just having opinions that are polarizing, but it made hundreds of millions of people be like, yes, I agree with him. And then on the other side, no. But at the same time, he's not hating on individual people as much. Um, not saying, you know, whatever he's doing or whatever as a, as a suggested thing, but at the same time, yeah. So I think it's, it's definitely for the right people. It could work really well. Of course. And again, there's a fine line with everything, right? It's case by case. If you were, you, you mentioned Tate. So if you're looking at someone like Tate and his like marketing strategy, like, do you think that was like extremely effective like really well taught out, really well articulated into his paid programs as like a creator, put it that perspective. I think, yeah, from a marketing strategy, it was was amazing, right? But I think 
probably cross the line in a number of things to get to that point. But if you have decided to kind of not care about anything legitimate and you're going to make money through your own way and that's it, he kind of could take that risk. And to be honest, I, um, I, I've, uh, I've, I've had the discussion with him and it was about the same thing about legitimacy versus just money um, around the topic of if you say such polarizing stuff, it's going to be harder for the normal world to then want to work with you for different things. But if you have, so it just depends on what your personal goal is, right? Because he was selling content behind a paywall and that's the only major revenue online, let's call it, that you want to have, then I guess the strategy works. And what was the strategy is, yes, go on to people's episodes or podcasts, be as amazing as you possibly can be, and then cut that up and spread that on 7,000 different accounts, right? So yeah, it would work, but you'd have to be willing to be that person and uh, forever to get those views across, you know, by what you're saying again. So I think that depends on the person. But as a strategy, if you were to remove what he's saying as context and just look at what the thing was all about retry. So right now, if your podcast channel had, you had 700 other accounts on YouTube posting the same content and clips, would you have more reach? You would. Will more people know about you? They would. So, you know, if you have the means to do that, that's the beauty of online and social media. Social media platforms want you to post more content. They want you to have more accounts. So in that way, there's nothing wrong with it because that's what the platforms are designed for. But it's not the way, I guess, everyone has learned how to make and spread content, right? You have your channel, you, you make your posts, and that's that. But this is like kind of gaming gaming social media through distribution. So I guess that that's probably the lesson here for anyone. Le thing. It's not about what he said. It's just, I guess, the strategy behind was smart and it worked. Um, so, yeah. When we went back to how you were saying I should create the episode and create the topics and create the questions, he did that from the guest perspective without the host even intentionally knowing or, or intentionally or not exactly. intentionally yeah. knowing. So it works he was both ways. Same for thing, yes. Yeah. So that's what you'll see people come on. Regardless of your question, people will say what they want to say because they have pre-planned it to be, this is going to hit hard. And I've seen this a lot. Jay Shetty does this. Lots of people do this. Like, you can ask me a question and the response would just be fully like, I've thought about these lines are going to be amazing and I'm, I'm going to find some time to say it. But again, that's just being smart. It's like a sales call, right? You get on a client. No matter what the client's asking you, at some point you're going to start saying, I have done this, I have done that, I can help you like this, I can do this for you. So it's a very similar thing. I guess you've got to be in sales mode, selling your personal brand. Of course. Of course. But it's going back to like books like uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini, uh, Key Personal of Influence by uh, Daniel Priestley. They talk about the, the same concepts, right? And now reading those books and looking at Tate's stuff over the last two years, you can clearly see that logical explanation of him positioning himself as an authority, him having the experience from kickboxing as well as like an entrepreneurship space, being able to help other people. So like the social proof and then packaging this together, like led to this like virality effect of just craziness. Right? It was like one of the most crazy yeah. things of all time. So it's kind of like, a, it's like the perfect ingredients to like a fucking to virality is basically all put together whereas that would be a contrast with other people right a lot of people that you work with for instance like mike i've heard mike say on a podcast that like he's like i don't want nothing to do with uh like drama online he's like i just don't want nothing to do with it and that's quite interesting right because two people that grew obviously one bigger than the other but two different strategies and got to a very big position as a result like it just depends on your personal goal there's no right or wrong answer right it's about how fast you want to grow um, but then you can have a bad side to it, which we saw. Um, and, but then everyone's ambition is different. It's the same as business, right? If you just think of it as a business, you know, businesses grow in different speed, different ambition, different goals. And it's the same as being a creator. So it just really depends on you and what you're trying to do. Mike is very, he likes to do what he wants to do. He wants to be comfortable with that. He wants to live the lifestyle that he likes. And he won't jeopardize that because of more ambition in business, for instance. So everyone has their own understanding of what they truly want. Same as me for my business. And I think, so that's what it all comes down to. It's not right or wrong. There are different abilities. So Mike also is value-based content. He had value and that's what he gave to grow his audience. Um, and that's probably one of the best ways because he can sit and talk to camera and make a video and actually say something useful for somebody. Not that many people can do that. So I think that's the skill to really train, which will be worth a lot. 
um, ultimately. That's interesting, right? <laughs> because that's one of the core competencies of this. And it's something that yeah. I work on a lot, my speech and getting across a message, whether it's a, a real or a long form video. So I find it quite funny how that's like one of the core areas that people struggle with because that's a big part of the business, right? Let's talk about how we switched from the creator to the entrepreneur and that transition. So you mentioned audience building, which we talked about, business opportunities, audience growth, higher revenue, more capital to invest in your content business. How do you get people to switch that mindset between I'm just going to create and I'm going to become an entrepreneur? There's an inflection point for sure. So I think every creator's journey is the following. They start posting, they wake up, can't believe it's grown more, can't believe it's grown more. I recently started working with a creator. He was on 200,000, I believe, in the start of this year. Now he's on 3 million. His name is June. He's a young kid in America. He's studying still at university. So you go through this natural phase of this is working. I need to make another reel. I need to make another video. I need to keep chasing. I need to keep doing it. What I mean by the inflection point is because when you like, holy shit, this actually is now actually working and it's not going away. It's not like after two days, after two weeks, after two months, you have a fear of it's going to stop. Followers are going to stop. Views are going to stop. And I'm explaining the mindset of a creator that's growing. Then you'll start to make some money in some capacity, which will change your life. So I guess for me, the inflection point is post that. That's when you are now ready to become an entrepreneur as a creator, because now you kind of have realized what has happened. I am now famous. I have followers. I actually have lots of people that trust me, believe me, look at me, and I have this audience, and I'm okay with this now. Yes, okay, I made $20,000, $50,000 wow, okay, I actually don't need to do a job or don't need to go to university. This is actually going to be my career now. Okay. And to be honest, that's the moment where it's like, okay, you're an entrepreneur now. That's probably the moment where I normally come in because we have the luxury of not really needing to work with anyone smaller anymore. And so it's like begins there to be like, how shall we shape your business? And what I love about what I do, because I get to work with people and strategize on how are we going to make money now and where do we begin? So in June's example, it was we launched, he, he creates all content about studying. So we launched a study guide, basically, and we've sold multiple six figures in a couple of months, an absolute success. He drives about 200,000 people to his website a month, insane traffic for free. And now we're coming up with a, there's going to be a second product, which is more like a physical. Then it's going to be like a long form content based, you know, course based product. So then we start to just map out the strategy. And again, after doing this so many times, the level of execution and everything that I bring to the table then just helps snowball that person. So ultimately, yeah. So that's the journey between it's just a mindset change. It's the it's someone accepting to themselves as a creator that, okay, I'm ready now to become a business person. I'm gonna have to sit in meetings, I'm gonna have to look at presentations, I'm gonna have to start looking at contracts, I'm gonna actually have to start, you know, working in some way. It's normally after they've spent some money, bought a Chanel bag, if it's a girl, went to Bali, they've done that stuff and got out of the system. The first thing you would do when you get some money stuff. So basically it's post that is like where I like to operate. That's super interesting, man. And in terms of how you operate then, is it only on a rev share that you work with them? Um, to be honest, I probably have every single business model you can imagine in the business now, just because of the amount of people we work with, things that we do. So yes, generally, we like to have some percentage, uh, if that's a revenue share, profit share, commission, equity, because I like to be in it for the long term with select people. With that being said, though, yes, we have plenty of retainers, upfront fees, and other forms of making revenue too. Um, because some of the client businesses are large. We have hired dedicated teams for some companies. So you gotta remember it's like we're incubating a creative business and some of them are getting really big by themselves. They have like a 10 person team hired just for that business. So it just goes far beyond the standard one service. I guess I've been in business for a very long time. So yeah, over the years, the model has just improvised and grown. But I would safely say like 99% of creators are definitely on a percentage type deal with us because that's why it interests me. We're not here to do some services and get paid monthly. Personally, like that's the worst type of thing. That's my nightmare, which would be I do some work, I get paid for it. I do some work, I get paid for it. Like it has to be that I'm building something where the unthinkable can happen like sell $5 million in a day. Now, you know, that's what drives me to be like, 
okay, those moments is what we chase as a team. I still remember I slept in the office. We released Shreddy. It hit number one in the app store globally. That feeling of like, holy shit, that's our app that we made and it's sitting number one in the app store, which like only select few people in the world ever get to experience. So to be honest, me and my team, like we, are, we chase those moments basically uh, because there's nothing like, it's like winning the World Cup, but in business. Um, and I think it's, that, that's the feeling you chase. My main team's with me, been with me for five years now. We've had so many of these moments. And for anyone listening that has a business, I would say that's what you need to really build culture. Like no book's going to tell you, no values on the wall, no how many times you take them out for lunch, dinner, buy some beer. Like all that shit is going to make no difference to your culture or how many perks you give or if you finish at two o'clock on a Friday. All that stuff is textbook stuff which does not work. I've done it all. I paid for therapy sessions. I've, I've done almost every type of perk you can imagine free Apple watches, to free cinema tickets, to free this. Nothing builds culture like actually doing something useful together. Um, so yeah, that's been my massive thing in my business that's really led it to, I guess, yeah, be successful. And that's what got you to the insane scale, right? If everyone paid you a fucking flat fee or whatever, you're not going to you're not gonna walk to that goal. You're probably not going to get the talent either, right? As a result, no. you're not going to get yeah. good engineers or good ops people or so on and so forth. Those numbers get pretty fucking crazy though the way you're describing it so if you're doing like 20 percent on shreddy or whatever it is like that's what's getting you towards 100 million right or 200 million from here like these launches these big effect these big uh, events and as they grow on over time correct 100 percent. so the whole thing is we scale together you know so, uh, at times it may not work out it may not grow as fast as you wanted to but ultimately that's the goal and that's how the business has naturally grown because of our interests are aligned because in a normal agency client relationship there's some you know it's arbitrage for a way priority these services and we'll get paid for it the agency can try and do as cheaply as possible to make their own money the client is going to complain as much as possible to get the most value out of that deal so it's, 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 it's a very tough place to be and i feel sorry for people under that business model for us from the very first call it's like we're going to do this as partners yeah, our interests are aligned. It may cost me more money or it may cost me more this, but I'm willing to do the effort. I'm willing to put in the time with the team or money or even co-invest in stuff if the end result's going to be something big. Um, so I guess there's more risk attached to it because you could do a lot of work and it has happened to us and you launch with a creator and they don't sell as well, but that's how we've kind of learned over time that, okay, TikTok is not as good as Instagram so or YouTube. If someone big on TikTok is X. So then we've learned lots of different ways to test it and why we keep developing like the data side of the business to understand because you still make mistakes even to this day where you think everything is right about this creative but still something wasn't right. And it could be the product, could be this, could be that, but that's the risk attached to it. It's almost like 80-20, right? In this case of some things may fail still, which is okay. It, it sounds like you're almost like a, a venture capitalist, basically, and you're investing in all these miniature startups. Basically, and then. Yeah you know, like five or six of them might pop or so on and so forth. And I, I really resonate with that because like even for myself, I started on like a retainer base for a lot of stuff. And we, we did we did well in that instance. But then we moved into rev shares off the products of the companies and then as well as on the sponsorships. And that's when like it actually gets a bit wild, right? Because it's variable, but it's variable in the right way a lot of the times, right? Because you're building good creators or you're getting good brands. And we work with like Shopify. We work with a lot of big like tech companies, and basically bring them sponsorship. So I think that's quite interesting because I'm learning through this, observing people like yourself and seeing how I can even get to the next level as someone who's a business owner versus just a creator, right? Um, I want to ask you, get into the details of your operations. So you said that you front a lot of the cash if you need to. Are you building out like everything yourself and then looking at the ROI long-term, like you're fronting the cash? How does that work from that perspective? No. So I think, yeah, one of the best things about our business model is that creators themselves take the risk um, for their own business because they should. So a lot of our competitors have gone bust. There's actually one that I saw last week. They did that. And the value proposition is all wrong if you're putting in the money. Um, the creator has to put in the money because they then care about it. So the truth is I did invest in lots in the early days and I realized the difference between people that put their money in and the don't and the way they work, the work ethic, the way they care, how much they promote, all that stuff. Um, then a manager gets involved and a manager is going to be saying this and that because they've seen another opportunity. 
So we've kind of gone through it to understand that we shouldn't. If I do now, then I take equity. So I'm actually investing in the business as an investing partner, just like a normal VC would, but we also operate the business. So that's why we set up Gemflow Ventures and we've been investing in creators. I've just done two recently and they're all coming out soon. These are like bigger bets we're investing in to be like, okay, we could be this. But the truth is like, you know, Prime happened right in front of me. I know KSI Logan's manager. And uh, one of the reasons it didn't happen was because um, they were looking for an upfront fee. And we don't do that in our model. We never pay the creators to work with them. So Congo Brands, who are the guys behind Prime, they did it. They paid them seven figures. And that's why they got the deal. But seeing that from afar and being slightly close to them uh, in other areas, it's made me realize about what can be, how big it could get with a creator brand. Hence why we're now investing in the right opportunities and trying to build our version of A Prime, which I have equity in, because clearly that's the big play. I want to build a creator brand and exit it. And I very soon enough, hopefully, will do that one day. So yeah, but overall, you know, creators invest their own money. We only invest if we think it's going to be worth it from a different, like an exit potential. Otherwise, I wouldn't. And you were recently working with Iman on his drink coming down the coming down the line at the moment, which is a coffee drink alternative. How do you think about that in terms of like alignment with his audience and the potential that could be there? Yeah, I guess uh, that that's a uh, that's something massive coming, and I we are partners in it, me and him. So uh, uh, equity partners. I don't want to say too much, but yeah, a lot of thinking is going into building a direct to consumer brand which is going to be big basically and that's like one part of it from probably what you saw online um but there's lots coming basically yeah it's nice because it's sick to see how you're able to refocus your model on different people and say this is how you apply it right so i want to ask you even about yourself in terms of how do you stay focused because you have your finger in so many different pies how do you stay aligned to like what the mission is you want to achieve it's just the, just the feeling of it, right? Even before this, to be honest, Iman was just texting me about this project and we're just going back and forth on a bunch of different things. And it's just that. Then it'll be something else. Then it'll be something else. How to stay focused on it is because it's so fun. Like genuinely, I'm doing things I want to do with some really cool people. And what I mean by that is I've always, back to my story, I've always was buying and selling the thing that was hot when I was a kid. So if that was a PlayStation game or a movie or a certain thing or a certain phone. When the flip phones first came, I was selling them and Sony Ericsson, then the this, then that, then the iPhones. So whatever the thing is, I've always been very good at knowing this is the thing right now and we need to sell more of this thing. Chris Williamson, James Smith and myself, we're launching a drink. It's called uh, Newtonic. It's a productivity drink. We're answering the exact thing that you just said because of how big the nootropic space is, how big the productivity space is, and all the people that they know, it made complete sense to try to go down this thing and by kind of doing a co combination brand to we have US and UK audiences plus the operations that I have. Um, again, I've, I've invested in that for the exact same reason. So is seeing the opportunity in the market and trying to place the right creator, brand, product, value proposition and trying to put it together to go for it. And ultimately, that's how I stay focused because I'm interested in that generally. So then when the opportunity presents itself, then it becomes very easy to stay focused on it. So I'm not a type of person that needs to do things to stay focused because the thing itself is keeping me focused is the point. So it doesn't matter what time I wake up, doesn't matter like, oh, I don't believe in any of that. So there's no routine there's no nothing. It's literally trying to do as much as I physically possibly can every single day. And I just stay focused on that. So what's actually hard is not getting distracted with the different things I'm doing to focus on the biggest opportunity or the thing that needs me the most and stuff like that. So because I deal with actual people and clients and high caliber people, that's where it probably gets hard where someone wants you, someone wants to get on the call with you, but I'm on a call with somebody else or whatever. So there's like physical things like that. But yeah, from a general work perspective, like, yeah, I'm super focused. I want to finish up on this point. So you've always been thinking ahead, whether it's on Amazon, on eBay, even with creators now. 
what's your thoughts on like the future of content, even from a platform perspective? So let's say if it's like Instagram or even how we're delivering content, like what are you and your team looking at for 2024 all the way up to 2030 maybe? I think as of right now, the thing that I'm probably interested in the most as a new that I haven't delved into too much is streaming. I think that's something very unique that people are watching people for hours. They have forever, but before it was under games or in like Asia, it's people like, like watch other people eat or like dance or that sort of stuff. But I think for the first time, it's seeming like to me that people are just watching people talk about lots of stuff for a long period of time. And I think that's quite unique and I'm interested to delve into it because I wonder how much depth is with that audience and people because it's like it's different because the watch time audience to creator will be so much that that should have its own unique advantage over somebody so I think I'm quite interested in that I think uh, people that chase the thing that's popular as in like jumpy subtitles because they saw it here or there I think those people will slowly slowly just struggle because they're just focusing on the wrong stuff and not the value that you're saying. You've seen um, channels that post completely the different stuff to what other people are posting but still do well just because of the value in their speaking. So I think I think the bar to become a creator is definitely lower. But at the same time, I think we'll actually see that the smarter people will start to rise, which we're seeing already now from the creator space because we're going from people that look the best sounded the best, had the initial traction on social media because it's easy to like them. She looks good, like, he looks good, like, or, you know, oh, he, he's got money, like, whatever. And I think the value always rises to the top, almost in every industry, always. So I think that's what's naturally going to happen. Hence why I'm more interested in someone who's more switched on and smarter and understands stuff versus someone who looks the part or talks the part or has something. So I think that that's kind of like my thinking, to be honest. Overall, I'm not a long thinker. I honestly can't tell you what I'm doing past March. Um, I'm very narrow, focused person. I solve what's in front of me. This whole, so many people ask me, what's your five-year plan? I'd be like, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. I may sell the company. Company might go bust. Or we might be 10 times the size. But the whole vision, mood board, long-term planning, like I would never have known 10 years ago that I would be at this stage in my life. So it's pointless. If I focus on solving the stuff in front of me, like, so I'm very narrow-minded in that way on purpose. And I like it. Because then you just stop stressing about the what if. Because you're not like thinking about it. Um, so yeah. that's what 100% man. I, I love that because like you're you're often reacting to what's happening in front of you, right? And you are a problem solver, you're CEO, that's what's going to happen. But you're going to find the next opportunity within there that's not bullshit, right? That's going to be exactly. aligned to your audiences. I thought it was quite interesting how you mentioned with streaming because there, there are a lot of streamers, people like Sneeko, few other people that get these huge like audiences that people listen for four hours or six hours, right? Not me that listens to these six hours, but it's interesting to see how you can monetize those audiences and what type of products that would suit them. So, Sean, I want to say a massive thank you. Hopefully, this is very helpful for creators, especially in the beginning, trying to see that part when you look at the big big boys and how this came back around. You know, there's another discussion another day for all on the business side of things, but I love your perspective on things. And, and to be honest, this is very even inspiring for myself to try push for more, make it better, make it more applicable, and get to new users. So I want to say a massive thank you, sir. And I appreciate it. Any small creator listening, you have to be strategic with your content. It's just not going to happen. The idea that you can post whatever you want and it's going to be, it's going to work, like it just isn't true. And I can say this by seeing all the stuff that I've seen. You can check out gemflow.com, our clients and who we work with. And you can see that th the people are at the top who have the most thinking in place, literally speaking, and who then practice their work enough to get better at it from a delivery point of view, from how they speak, the editing point of view. And it's people who do it enough, the repetition, the practice, are the ones that are winning. And don't look at other people. I would add to that, if you're still struggling to be like, I don't know what to do, I would go find five people that are closest to you and reverse engineer their strategy and look at how many times they upload, what do they do, it's interesting that they do this, did that, and you'll start to see patterns that which are clearly working on social media. So right now on YouTube, if your thumbnail says the word, I'm sorry, if your title says the word you, it gets way higher views than if it says like I or we or anything else. 
So even looking at yours right now, I don't know, like, you've got the brutal truth about modern relationships. If it was the brutal truth about your relationship, that would be more applicable because it's speaking to you. So we're seeing literal titles doing that do better. So you have to be that boring at it that you have a spreadsheet and you put the titles of your competitors and sit and be like, why did this one, this one? If I take out that's a big star, you can take off the percentage increase for that person because that's a bigger person. But there'll still be real insight in that because you can't learn everything by doing. And that's the misconception. The people are like, oh, well, on my page, when I did this, this worked. So I'm just going to keep, I'm going to try again. Right? And it's a very natural creator thing to get stuck into. Or when I post this much, or when I added this many hashtags, this one did better, so I'm going to do this one again in the exact same way. It's like, but do that same exercise on the market. And then you'll start to see that, oh, but there's also these 17 other things that I need to try one of those next time instead of trying to hyper, you know, do mine again and again. So it's the inner workings of it. To be honest, that's why we actually just launched Creator College. It's creatorcollege.com. Um, haven't publicly fully launched it yet, but it's doing well in the background where we set up education for micro creators to help them learn this stuff. So in that, me and my team are literally taking you through all the different things that we learn. There's a community and all that stuff because we want to educate the next generation of creators and hopefully in that, some will grow massively that we can sign. Um, so kind of playing the long game for myself, for the business, I should say. And is helping us also practice some of the stuff that we learn with our creators even more so um, and put it into education. So, yeah, that's what I would say to anyone listening to this that wants to grow their channels, wants to grow their following. Got to really put the work in and it'll happen. 100%. I'll link all those down below as well because I really do appreciate this across our website, across our YouTube, across our audio. So I want to say a massive thank you, sir. Thank you so much for everything. Cool. No, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. Enjoyed it.